Ta-da, the, the green screen, it's back. I don't, I don't know what's actually going on back there because there's nothing there right now and I haven't decided what'll be there. It's the magic of video editing. There's something though. Well, all right, here we go. So TikTok really, really loves creepy romances and adult women really, really love mafia romances, most of which are also very creepy. Probably the most prominent one that has come out, well, ever, is 365 Days. Like, it was a series of books which got turned into a series of movies, and it is about a woman who is literally kidnapped by a mafia boss and then falls in love with him. They're, they're terrible. I, I admittedly haven't read the books, but the movies are terrible. So it's about time that somebody made a mafia romance for TikTok, and that's what Brutal Prince is, because there's nothing more romantic than racketeering, money laundering, and throwing snitches in the ocean with a cinder block tied to their leg. Except this one isn't about all that weirdo, creepy mafia stuff. No, no, this is about an arranged marriage to prevent a war between two families who each have a lot of wealth and power. So it's basically a fantasy story, but it's edgier. So you have the Gallows, who run the Italian Mafia in Chicago. Also, their name is Gallows. It, it sounds like Gallows, like the place where you hang people. Do you get it? <laughs> yeah. So you have the Gallows, and you have the Griffins, who run the Irish Mafia in the same city. They have been rivals for generations, and when the daughter of the Gallo boss, whose name is Ida Gallo, at least, I think it's pronounced Ida. That, that's how I'm going to be saying her name. Uh, she does something stupid that threatens to spark off a war, so her father just marries her off to the son of the Griffin boss, and his name is Callum Griffin, and he is also running for the alderman of the Chicago's 43rd Ward, which, if you don't know what that is, the book explains it a little bit, but it's not important, okay? It's just some political position, there's an election, he's trying to do some mafia business stuff. It, it's, that's all it is, okay? Don't worry about it. And I'll tell you right now that Brutal Prince is terrible. I hate it, just, <laughs> why? Like, that's what I came away from this thinking. There's so many parts where I was just going, why? Why are you doing this to me? Like, it, it's trying really, really hard to be steamy and hot, but it fails because the author's idea of steamy is physical and sexual abuse. <laughs> like, I, I'll be honest, I have never seen so many daddy issues contained in one location, and I used to live across the street from a fucking strip club. <laughs> That's not a joke, by the way. That is, that is true. I swear to every god, if romance authors went to therapy, the world would be 20% better than it currently is. But I can't really be mad at porn for not being aimed at me, you know? Like, that, that's what this is. It's porn. It's aimed at people other than me. I can't be mad at that. What I can be mad at is the way that Brutal Prince completely fails as a story. In every conceivable way, it fails as a story. Because if Brutal Prince and its fans are going to pretend it's a real book, then I'm going to treat it like it's a real book. Now, why have I done this? Because I'm trapped in a hell of my own creation. Let's get started. So, we start with a chapter from Ida Gallo's POV. In fact, the book goes back and forth a lot. Like, we get uh, Ida chapter, and then Callum chapter, and just the whole book is like that. So it's pretty evenly split between the two of them. There are fireworks outside because one of the Griffin daughters is having a birthday party. She just turned 19. Also, just to be clear, Ida is 21 in this story, and Callum, the guy she gets married to, is 30. A bit of a age gap there, but they're both adults, so I don't really care. Now, Ida decides to crash the party with her brothers. Now, she has three brothers in total. Why do they decide to do this? Because they're dumbasses. Yeah, the rival mafia family surely won't do anything to hurt you. They're not going to take advantage of this opportunity to cut their enemy down to size, and they'll take this insult with a smile. You know, when, when have organized crime families ever killed someone to protect their reputation? So they do separate once they get to the party, and Ida starts playing around in the mansion, and then she winds up going up to the library. Jiminy Crickets, it's a nice fucking house. I mean, I know we're supposed to be mortal rivals and all, but I can appreciate a place decked out better than anything I've ever seen on House Hunters. House Hunters International, even. Christ on a cracker, that, that line is trying so hard. This entire book, the writing, is just filled with moments that are trying way, way too hard. And you might be wondering, like, why is Ida even up in the library? Because we need the plot to start. That's all. That's the only reason. So she picks up an old pocket watch, which is sitting around, and then someone comes in, and she just absently puts it in her pocket and then hides. 
and the guy who comes in is Callum Griffin, and he just starts chilling out there. You know, he's just hanging out in the library for a bit. We find out from his chapter he's just trying to de-stress a little bit, and Ida hides, and seeking an escape, she actually starts a fire as a distraction. <laughs> Like, yeah, there's a fireplace going, and there's some curtains, so she just sets the curtains on fire. And she runs off, but Callum sees her, and then he figures out pretty quickly who it was that went in there and stole the pocket watch, which belonged to his grandfather, it's actually re really important to him, and he gets really mad. That's when my eye falls on the mantle spattered with foam. I see the carriage clock in the hourglass. My grandfather's pocket watch is missing. I hunt around on the ground and even in the embers of the birch logs, in case it fell inside the grate somehow. Nothing. It's nowhere to be found. Those fucking wops stole it. Well, there really is nothing more romantic than racism. <laughs> but don't worry, he's not the only one to use racial slurs. Oh, get off it. Nero won't take Dante's shit, even if it comes to blows. Since when are you a good boy? You hate those patty fucks as much as we do. Who cares if we ruin their party? You know, that, that's how you know somebody is properly racist when they are not only being racist against other groups of white people, but they're using slurs that haven't been uttered aloud in the past 50 years. I'll be honest with you, I don't even know if I'm allowed to say a lot of those words on YouTube, so we'll see if this video gets censored or not. So, Ida leaves along with all of her brothers, and then her and her brother Sebastian go off by themselves to go to another party, and Callum, again, catches up with them, and he's with a hired thug whose name is Jack, and Jack and Callum corner the two of them and he demands the watch back, and Ida like just straight up forgot she had it. Like It's just been sitting in her pocket for the past hour or so. And then a fight breaks out, and Jack winds up stomping on Sebastian's knee, breaking it really badly, which is especially bad because, you know, that could possibly cripple him, and he's a basketball player. And then Ida throws the watch into the river, and Callum dives after it. He doesn't manage to get it back, but you know, he, he tries. Then Ida and Sebastian do manage to subdue Jack and they escape. And when they tell their family what happened, they start prepping for war. But the fathers of both families are being cool-headed and they actually set up a meeting between the two of them so that they can talk this out without things becoming more violent than they already have. While the two dads are talking, all the kids just kind of hang out in a room and stare at each other. Nero is vain about his appearance, with good reason. While all my brothers are handsome, Nero has that male model prettiness that makes girls' panties spontaneously combust. I don't know a single girl who hasn't slept with him or tried to. Okay, number one, that's a strange thing to say about your own brother. Number two, how would your panties spontaneously combust? Like, how, how does lubrication and wetness lead to fire in your mind? How does that, how does that add up? Anyways, after a couple hours, the dads come back and they say that Callum and Ida are getting married. Like, they both the dads agreed to that and then they said, okay, our kids are getting married. And both of them moan about it and their siblings are also kind of off-put by it, but they do agree pretty quickly. Fine, I struggle to maintain my temper, but what about after this month? Do you honestly expect me to stay married to her forever? Yes, I do, my father says seriously. The gallows are Catholic, the same as us. You'll marry her, you'll be faithful to her, and you'll father children with her. <laughs> oh, he was serious. That wasn't intended to be a joke. I, I'm sorry, but expecting a crime boss to not cheat on his wife is like expecting a priest to have sex with consenting adults. It's just not a thing that happens. Now, this setup might sound a little weird and cheesy, and that's because it is, but it is actually a real thing that Mafia families do. Like, they really do marry off their children to each other to, you know, forge alliances and stuff. They're, they're basically like feudal lords, which, you know, makes sense. Like, both feudal lords and Mafia families are people who came to power via force and have a few loyal followers that keep the peons producing on their behalf so that they can live in luxury. They're, they're not that different when you think about it. So the Gallows, according to Callum's father, hold the key to the Italian vote, and the election is a guaranteed win for Callum if they work together. Plus, this avoids a war, and their business and interests can benefit each other. But Ida and Callum just really hate each other, and they're upset about this. But again, they just, they just kind of go along with it. A few days later, there's an engagement party, and they pretend that they've been dating in secret for 18 months, and that's now why they're engaged. Like, that's the story they tell the public. The wedding is also only two weeks away. Like, they're gonna plan it and just get it out of the way as soon as possible. During the engagement party, Ida learns that Callum is allergic to strawberries. Hey look, the, the cover is relevant! 
sort of, for a, for a minute, you know, it's sort of. So the day before the wedding, they send Ida to a spa so that she can get all prettied up, you know, have her hair done, get her skin exfoliated, all that. And she's obviously not happy with it because she's the headstrong and willful protagonist and she's not gonna take this kind of shit. Fuck you, stop texting me right now, I, stop. They want to pluck me and exfoliate me and rub off all my rough edges, make me some smooth, soft little wifey for the scion of their family, the great Callum Griffin. He's their JFK, I'm supposed to be their Jackie Kennedy. I'd rather be Lee Harvey Oswald. <laughs> that, that was funny. There's, there, there's a couple funny lines in this book. But here's the thing, no matter how upset she is, Ida does go along with it. Because women in romance novels are not allowed to have any actual agency. That's not a thing that they're allowed to have for whatever reason. And, you know, having a spa day is not that bad. So she's actually into it for a while. You know, she's getting a mud bath and everything. And at one point she lays down and falls asleep. And there's, there's no easy way to put this. And again, I hope I don't get demonetized or anything. But while she's asleep, one of the workers starts giving her a Brazilian wax without her consent. And the, the book refers to it as a bikini wax, but they describe it. It's very clearly a Brazilian wax. You know, a, a bikini wax is where you have on bikini bottoms and they just wax around that. A Brazilian is where they get everything. Whatever, not important. What the fuck? <laughs> Jesus Christ. You don't do that to someone without asking permission. And why would you do it? Why would you like prepare her for it and then start while she's asleep? Like that is a horrible thing to wake up to. <laughs> now Ida is mad at this because she realizes that Callum or whoever were the ones that actually set this up and they're basically demanding that she do this on their behalf and it's like they're saying they own her. And she's tempted to just leave her bits partially waxed but eventually she does give in just because she doesn't like the way it looks. It takes three more strips and a whole lot more swearing to get off the remaining heat hair. When they're finished, I'm completely bald, the cool air touching me as it never has before. It's fucking humiliating. It's whatever the feminine version of emasculating would be. I'm like Samson. Callum stole my hair and stripped me of my power. I'm going to get back at him for this, that conniving perverted fuck. He thinks he can wax my pussy without consent. He doesn't know what he started. Oh my god. Now fundamentally, that's what's wrong with Ida's character. Like, she has so much fire and passion in her thoughts, but in the end she always caves to what others tell her to do. You know, no matter how much she stomps her feet and says, I'm not going to do it, she always winds up doing exactly what other people tell her to do. Like, this whole book is just a series of scenes where people say, Ida, go do this! And she says, no! And then the other person says, do it! And she says, fine. That, that's basically the whole book. And because of that, she fails as a love interest and she fails as a protagonist. Or, I guess deuteragonist would be more accurate here because, there, you know, there's two of them. So it's deuteragonist. Neither of them is really the main, main character. But yeah, that's why Ida fails as a deuteragonist. And Callum fails as a deuteragonist because he's a psychotic misogynist. I'm not joking. This man is a psychopath. Like, we get half the book from his POV and he has some very wonderful thoughts like this. But when I break up with a woman, I feel the same as when I throw away an old pair of shoes. I know I'll find a replacement soon enough. I smirk a little, thinking about her spa day yesterday. The point of that, obviously, was to get her ready for tonight. I'm supposed to consummate the marriage, and I'm not fucking some messy little ragamuffin in flip-flops and jean shorts. I expect her to be properly groomed, head to toe. I love the idea of her being primped and cleaned and waxed to my specifications, like a little doll, built just the way I like it. I'd get Ida pregnant right this second, purely because of how furious it would make her. That would be one way to tame the beast. How... how the fuck is this hot? Seriously, how is this hot? Like, does the average straight women really fantasize about men who act and think the way Callum Griffin does? Look, I understand the difference between fantasy and reality. I understand that a lot of people out there have weird sexual ideas that they understand would be unpleasant if it happened in reality, so it just, it stays up here, and they're cognizant of that. But if stuff like this, if stuff like this gets you off, I have to assume it's because your father didn't hug you as a child. So anyways, the two of them get married, and Ida eats a whole bunch of strawberries beforehand, and purposely poisons Cal with it. And she, he's unnecessarily forceful about the kiss with, you know, when he, when the priest says, you may now kiss the bride, like he grabs her and like, 
really goes to town on her when she doesn't want him to, so you don't have to feel that bad for him getting poisoned with something he's allergic to. Uh, but he's a lot more allergic than Ida realized, so he actually swells up and is unable, unable to breathe. His mother runs over and gets him with an EpiPen, and then he needs to go to the ER for the night. Again, I don't feel that bad for him. And he's only in this situation because he assaulted somebody and possibly crippled uh, Ida's brother, remember? And because he's been just an ass to his new wife this whole time, you know? And also, Ida thought that he would just wind up getting some hives on his face and look really bad in their wedding photos. She wasn't trying to kill him, but she also, again, she doesn't feel that bad about it. So then Ida has to move in with the Griffin family, because again, they're, they're married, and it's not like a green card marriage. They have to actually be married and make children and stuff. And when she arrives at their mansion, Cal's mother threatens her with death if she tries anything. Like, don't hurt my family, I'm a mama bear! But she's not, un she's not intimidating in the slightest. And Ida is also very unimpressed with her, so it's actually, it's a slightly funny scene. However, that makes Ida seem more like she's a hostage, you know? It, it doesn't seem like she's just there against her will. It makes it seem like she's there against her will, and she's there to make sure that her family doesn't step out of line, you know? It feels like the Gallows have sworn fealty to the Griffins. So Callum is chilling by the pool, and after unpacking, Ida goes up to him and says hello. And, once again, there's no easy way to put this, but Callum grabs her and drags her underwater and holds her under there for a bit to teach her a lesson. I pulled her under the water to give her a taste of her own medicine. See how she likes clawing and gasping for air, helpless against the necessity of breathing. It made me feel better, for a minute, but it also made me feel something else. Her body twisting and writhing against me. It wasn't supposed to be sexy. I'm not psycho! You're psycho! This man got turned on while physically assaulting his wife. There's nothing I can add to that to make it sound worse than it is. Girl, just run. Like, Ida, j seriously, just pack up and run. Your family can try to hide you. <laughs> just run. So, anyways, after their synchronized waterboarding session, uh, he lets her go, and he compares her not being able to breathe to his allergic reaction, so, like, not quite the same, but sure, whatever. And Ida goes to take a shower. You know, her clothes are all soaked and everything. And then Cal comes in while she's taking a shower and he acts really aggressive towards her, but they're both turned on and then they do the sex. Yeah, they, they in spite of hating each other 10 minutes ago, they just decide, now's a good time to smash. I'm obviously not going to read the sex scene out loud, but the books make sure to emphasize how Cal is super muscular and works out constantly while Ida eats way too much and doesn't exercise that much and has curves, you know? That makes her super special and not like other girls TM because she has curves. She's not trying to look skinny like a runway model. <laughs> Jesus. Look, it's not the 90s, okay? Hourglass figures are neither rare nor disliked by society at large. Like, they are the standard of beauty nowadays. This is literally the equivalent of a man going, Oh, I'm only six foot three and have a bunch of chiseled facial features. No woman would ever want me. Also, why the fuck are they having sex now? Like, do they seriously have so little self-control that somebody who nearly killed them, and remember, they both nearly killed the other <laughs> in the past 24 hours, but are they, they have so little self-control that just seeing somebody naked means instant smashing? And, and for that matter, having Ida poison him and nearly kill him and then change her mind and think, you know what, maybe this guy is not so bad, so quickly makes her look like a psychopath as well, so neither of them looks great here. And, I don't know, Just for, we're like a third of the way through the book and after this they're just in love now? Yeah, they're, they're just, they're in love. They, I don't know why this is so common in romance novels, you know? like. Nothing but rancor between the leads, and then suddenly they're in love, like, just all at once. I don't know why that's a thing, but it is. Because it's not satisfying as a story beat, and it's also just not realistic. That's not how people act. I feel like either no one in romance novels acts like a regular human being, or they're just not acting the way I would, and I have much more self-respect than the average person. I don't know if that's the case, because I personally would not want to bone somebody who stole my grandpa's watch, or knowingly sent me to the ER, or who attacked my brother and broke his knee. And so, neither of them should want the other, but just they do now. And 
After that, everything is great and they get along fine. Cal has a sister named Nessa who is super nice and gives all her money to homeless people every day. Like, literally all her money that she has on her, she gives to homeless people every day, and Ida loves her. Which is exactly how I imagine somebody raised in a family of murderous psychopaths would act. Now, Nessa doesn't actually do anything, this doesn't lead to anything. This detail is just there to let Ida know that she no longer needs to worry and her new life will be amazing. And not long after this, uh, Cal demands that Ida comes to a special dinner with him. It's like a big party thing, whatever. And she needs to wear a specific dress. And she refuses, but he steals all her other clothes, so it's either wear the dress or go nude. And she does relent, obviously. And I, I just, I don't know. There's no way to put this other than to say that a lot of women really seem to like fantasizing about being completely subservient to an abusive man. And I don't know what that says about society. So they go to the dinner and there's a bunch of other important people there. And while they're there, they see a man named Zayak. I think that's how that's pronounced. Like he's the head of the Polish mafia in Chicago. And look, I don't speak Polish. Polish is an insult to the very concept of spoken language. I'm just going to be calling him Zayak. I hope you're okay with that. Now Zayak is a bad murderer who kills people for money and revenge. Unlike Callum, who is a good murderer, who kills people for money and revenge. Because we never get any specifics, but Cal does say that he has only killed people when it's necessary. And I'll be real with you, I want to know what his definition of necessary is, because it's probably different from mine. Now, Zayak is known as the Butcher of Bogota, like that's his nickname, Butcher of Bogota, because his brother used to be the head of the Polish Mafia in Chicago before a bunch of Colombians killed him, and then Zayak came and killed a bunch of them in Chicago and in Colombia in return. And he actually like cut them apart with like meat cleavers and stuff. And I'll be honest, Zayak getting revenge for his brother, even if like he's not a good person, just that backstory makes him way more sympathetic than any of the other characters in this book. In his narration, Cal says that there is a hierarchy of organized crime. On top there are the Irish, who aren't even actually crime bosses anymore, they just run businesses, and they also make shady deals in a legal gray area. But again, Cal makes vague references to sometimes killing people, so he's still a dark, edgy criminal. See, this way, we don't need to actually reconcile Cal's horrible actions with how sexy he is if we never actually explain his horrible actions. Isn't that convenient? Now, below the Irish are the Italians, who have some legitimate businesses, mostly construction, but they also do plenty of other illegal operations as well. Smuggling, drugs, prostitution, and they control the labor unions, so if you don't go through them, then your construction like, projects aren't going to work. You're like, you're gonna wind up with stolen supplies and stuff. You know, like an actual fucking mafia. And then the lowest tier are the Polish mafia, who still do traditional crime stuff like racketeering, illegal gambling, loan sharking, drugs, and bank robberies. Yeah, the Poles are still robbing banks. Like, what, what fucking year is it? Lower still, you've got the Polish Mafia. They're still participating in violent crime, in loud and obvious and attention-grabbing shit that causes problems for those of us who want to keep up the perception of a safe city. The Broaders Tuo is still actively running drugs and guns, boosting cars, robbing banks and armored cars, extorting, and even kidnapping. They get their dirty deeds published in the news and they're constantly pushing the boundaries of their territory. They don't want to stay in Garfield, Lawndale, and the Ukrainian village. They want to push into the areas where the money is, the areas I own. You know, organized crime typically does stuff that isn't very visible, like, you know, selling drugs and illegal gambling and stuff because the cops have gotten a lot better at their jobs in the past hundred years or so, and they don't want to go to prison. Anyways, Zayak is kind of butthurt because he has sons that could have married Ida, and he thinks that things would have gone well if he had merged his businesses with the Italian Mafia's businesses, and he also wants a tra transit property that Cal is going to control after the election because, I don't know, business, business, Mafia stuff, who gives a shit? Now, at this party, there is also Ida's ex-boyfriend. His name is Oliver, and he tries to come on to her, and he actually tries, like, reaching up under her dress, and Callum violently attacks him. And Callum might look better by comparison if he weren't also physically and sexual, sexually violent with Ida, so really this is just two horrible men fighting over her. But Cal is hot, and Oliver is a lot less hot, so we have to take his side. 
And then later, her and Callum have more sex. When I drive him into a rage like this, when he finally cracks and loses control, that's when I don't hate him. In fact, I almost like him a little, because that's when I see a little more of myself. When he has a temper, when he's angry, when he wants to kill somebody, that's when I understand him. That's when we finally have common ground. Oh, for fuck's sake. Now, Oliver is the son of a wealthy donor to Cal's campaign by the name of Henry Castle. And so Cal has a meeting with Henry where Castle requests the property in exchange for beating up his son. And Cal refuses because he's just so badass. Yeah, he's making enemies. He engages in impulsive actions. He's unable to negotiate. He's going to go real far in the business world, I'll tell you that much. Now, in the Griffin Mansion, Ida comes across Jack, who, remember, is Cal's bodyguard, and he's the one who broke her brother Sebastian's knee. And so she actually grabs a gun and points it at his leg, and she shoots, and hoping to cripple him the way he crippled her brother, which is stupid, and it's bad, but it is understandable, given the circumstances. And Cal intervenes, and the bullet goes wide and misses him, uh, but it does hit Cal in the arm. And he's mad, and then he violently drags her upstairs, and then they start having sex, but then he spanks her as punishment, and then they have more sex. There's actually, like, I think five or six sex scenes in the book in total. Now, at one of the Gallows construction sites, a fire starts and damages a bunch of stuff, and they go to investigate, and it turns out it was Zayak, because he left a boar's head at the scene. That's, that's his calling card. And while they're looking around investigating, someone drives by and shoots at them. No one dies, but it's pretty clear that Zayak is declaring war on the Irish and Italian mafias. Ida runs into Oliver again. He's kind of nice for a minute, but then he kisses her without permission, and then she shoves him away and storms off, which is totally reasonable. While this is happening, Cal, as well as Ida's brothers, Nero and Dante, you know, the ones who don't have broken knees, track down the shooter, and they torture him for information on where Zayak is. Wait, nope, sorry. They don't torture him. They just beat him up and then threaten his life for a minute. That's, that's totally different. You know, if the heroes tortured prisoners, we might have to acknowledge that crime families are full of terrible people, and I can't masturbate to that. I would have to read that book with both hands. So the guy they torture tells them about a girl that Zayak has been seeing, late, seeing lately, and they leave because they, you know, they're looking for Zayak, but he's in hiding. So Jack saw Ida and Oliver kiss, and he tells Callum about it. And he's clearly stirring up shit because, again, he, Oliver did it forcefully, and Ida pushed him away and left immediately afterwards. So if he saw, he saw that it wasn't something she initiated. So he's clearly stirring up shit, but again, that doesn't go anywhere. And Cal is mad, but he's also a sad boy. And he starts to think that, oh man, maybe I don't deserve Ida, which he doesn't. Now, the girl that Zayak has been seeing is named Francie. She's a stripper who works at a club called The Pole. It's, it's a strip club called The Pole, and it's owned by Zayak, who is himself Polish. That's kind of like calling an Italian restaurant noodles. Dude, if you were Polish and you jacked off, that would be a Polish pole polishing. <laughs> <laughs> like, why would you name a strip club The Pole? Like, we assume poles will be there. At least, if it's a big club, we assume there will be multiple poles there. If it's a smaller club, I guess there might only be one. I don't know, I'm not really an expert on strip clubs. I just read Yelp reviews of them sometimes, because those things are hysterical. So anyways, Ida and Cal go to the pole to try and find Francie. Meanwhile, her brothers attack one of Zayak's casinos, smashing it up and stealing some money. While they're there, a stripper named Eduardo does a performance, and then after, at the end of the performance, Eduardo tears his shirt off and it's revealed that he was a woman the whole time. That doesn't, that's not important. I didn't have to tell you about that. I just felt the need to share. Now they find out where Francie lives, but Cal winds up getting drugged by a waitress. And while they're trying to leave, they're captured by some men and Ida pretends to be drugged too. She didn't drink anything, and, but she also knows that like, okay, I can't run and I can't fight my way out of this. So I may as well just go along with it. And then they wake up in a meat locker and Zayak is there. Is there a point to this metaphor? I say impatiently. My shoulders are fucking burning. If Zayak's going to kill me, I'd rather he go ahead and do it already. Am I supposed to be the person swimming in the dirty water? No! He snaps eyes on my face now. That's everyone in Chicago who wants to think their city is clean. You're the person who eats the bacon thinking you're better than the man who butchered it. And here's the thing. Zayak is evil, but he's not wrong. Cal is a murderer. 
the book just doesn't focus on that, except when it wants to be edgy. So Zayak threatens to cut out Cal's appendix, he wants the transit property from earlier, he also wants the money that Ida's brothers stole from his casino, and he wants a government position after the election. Some men attack, and so Zayak and the others leave Callum alone, tied up, and then Ida hops in, and she frees him, and they escape in the chaos. You know, they open a grate, and they jump in, and they land in the river down below. And it turns out that nobody attacked, See, uh, again, Ida didn't drink the drugged drink, she only pretended to pass out, so the guards didn't bother tying her up and they left her unattended. So she was able to make some Molotov cocktails and threw them around so it looked like there was a big attack. And then the two of them kiss and say they'll never abandon each other. And two days later, Cal wins the election. He is now the alderman, and Zayak is still in hiding, because, which makes sense, you know, he's... He's at war with two separate families. Now Ida goes out to take care of some errands and Cal is convinced that she's seeing her ex-boyfriend. He has Jack follow her to see what's going on. He mopes about how she doesn't love him. But then Ida gets kidnapped and Cal tells her brothers about it and they think that Zayak is the one that took her because, you know, that actually makes sense given the circumstances. But Cal, see, he's smarter than the average bear. He thinks that her ex-boyfriend Oliver is the one that took her because she lost a shoe when getting kidnapped, and earlier she made a shoe metaphor, so clearly it was Oliver. Yeah, and anyways, they split up to look, and Cal is the one that's correct. You see, Oliver took Ida to an old beach house that they used to go to, and while they're there, he tries to convince her that she loves him, and she's just going crazy or something, I don't know, and Ida just says, no, I don't love you. And so he ties her up and says she'll never belong to anyone else. And then Cal arrives not long after, and he sees the whole house is on fire. Like, Oliver's just doing a murder-suicide routine, I guess. Which is kind of out of nowhere, but okay. So Cal runs in, he fights Oliver for a bit. The floor collapses, and Oliver falls down below into the flames and dies, presumably. And then Ida grabs Cal before he manages, before he falls. You know, so they save each other's lives, and then they run off. And then later they're calling the others on the phone, and it turns out Dante and Nero, off-screen, killed Zayak. Rest in peace, Zayak. Your only crime was being the sole character in this book to act like an actual fucking mafia boss. Which, granted, acting like a mafia boss requires you to do a lot of other crimes along the way. You know what? This joke doesn't work. Cut it out. But now, life is perfect. You know, the two leads say their wedding vows to each other in private, like, for real this time. Ida gives... Cal back his grandfather's watch. Turns out she actually hired somebody to go down into the river and retrieve it. And he opines for a minute about the luck of the Irish and how her starting a fire was the best thing that ever happened to him. And then it ends. And then there is a brief bonus epilogue, which I guess wasn't part of the original story, but then the author added it later. Uh, and it's, again, kind of pointless. They have a little bit more sex. There's a birthday party celebration. And then Ida tells Callum that she is pregnant, which is not at all surprising when you look at how much unprotected sex they were having. And just in case you were wondering, no, Callum was not pulling out. And somehow after this, there are five more books. I don't, I don't know how or why. Like, I don't know why every successful romance novel has a bunch of unneeded sequels where the only thing that happens is that the leads fight and then they have makeup sex. Like, seriously, that, that is the entirety of Fifty Shades of Grey, After, and 365 Days. Like, all of those series did the exact same thing. Like, the first book is mostly a contained story, and then just sequels where all they do is fight and have sex. So yeah, I didn't like Brutal Prince very much. It's not a good book. There are four actual characters in here, and the rest exist solely as background decorations. Those four characters are Cal, Ida, Oliver, and Zayak. Like, they're actual characters. They do have personalities. They're just not very likable. Because Cal is a psychotic misogynist, but it's okay because he's hot. Then we have Ida, who starts off pretty great actually, but is quickly revealed to be just like the protagonist of every other romance novel. She has tons of spunk, and she doesn't take anyone's bullshit in her thoughts. Like, her actions are all dictated by what others tell her to do. Like, the entire book. She just does what others tell her to do. She could easily be a great character who resists her position for a while before realizing that, hey, maybe this Cal guy isn't all that bad, and maybe I do love him. Which, granted, that would require Cal to actually not be that bad, but I digress. You know, you, you could do that with her. You could still have the romance, the mafia war, the enemies-to-lovers stuff, 
and you would have an engaging main character. You, you could even still have her be a self-insert if you did this. <laughs> you know, Jack Reacher is a self-insert Mary Sue, but he also has a personality and is an active character, so we still like him. Are you sure all comfortable spinning a counterfeit roll? You want me to buy you something? How about some jeans and tickets to a Hall & Oates concert? Then we have Oliver, the crazy ex-boyfriend who can't live without main character girl, so he tries to kill her and himself. It's not complicated, but it's... I mean, it's something. He's, he's not totally bland, like, he, he has something there. And finally, we have Zayak, an evil mafia boss who chops people up and is willing to go to great lengths to a gain wealth and power. You know, in other words, he acts like a real organized crime boss. <laughs> and so he, he, like, he's not a good person, but he works pretty well as a villain, but then the climax of the book just forgets that he exists. And I'll be honest, I'm not sure why, because he could have just been the one to kidnap Ida, or m maybe we could have it so that her ex-boyfriend was his son or something. You know, that way it would all tie together. And that's probably the biggest problem with Brutal Prince, is that it acts like it's about a romance in the midst of this mafia conflict, but it's not. You know, it's about two obnoxious, shitty people who have a lot of sex with each other, and sometimes they acknowledge that mafia stuff exists in the background. It's kind of like how... I, I talked about Chemical Garden not that long ago, and in that series, it claims it's about a horrifying dystopia where everyone dies at the age of 20 and women are turned into broodmares, but really it's about a teenage girl who watches mildly unpleasant stuff happen nearby. And then the world is magically saved. Like, she, she does nothing throughout the series. Like, someone in the comments section described it as being an entire genre, which it is, and they described it as mildly imperiled teen girl with passive personality. And Brutal Prince is a lot like those. Like, the characters aren't teenagers, and Ida is not completely passive, but that's basically what it is. She's just mildly imperiled, and then she's not, and she doesn't really do anything on her own for most of the book. And this passage actually explains it and sums it up pretty well. Why do you think people spend half a million dollars campaigning for an alderman seat when the salary is $122,304? I ask her. Well, obviously, you can fuck around with zoning and tax law and suit your business interests, as well as ha handing around favors to everybody else. Right, I say, encouraging her to go on guessing. It just doesn't seem worth the trouble. You can get all that shit with bribes and trading favors, or good old-fashioned violence. But you're always at the mercy of somebody else, I tell her. The incorruptible detective or the greedy politician who got a better offer from someone else. Real power isn't working the system, it's running the system. Building it yourself, even. I pause, remembering a little of our overlapping family history. You remember when the Italians ran this city? I say to her. Capone had the mayor on his payroll. Imagine if Capone had been the mayor, or the governor, or the fucking president. That right there is the problem. The mafias in this book are not real mafias. They're not even like romanticized versions of the mafias where they try to, you know, plaster over their flaws. They're just businessmen, but they're edgy. The author and the audience members who love this kind of shit want to feel like they're shacking up with a dangerous man, but they don't want to actually think about what that entails. You know, something, something, have your cake and eat it too. It's explicitly stated in here that the Gallo family runs brothels. If you've seen The Sopranos, do you remember how shitty the girls who worked at Tony Soprano's strip club were treated? Give me a break. In two seconds, I could get a job at any other... Listen to me, you little bujak. Do you pay what you owe? That shave twat of yours belongs to me! I can't imagine the Gallows are a whole lot better with their girls. Because if you're a nice organized crime boss, you will be killed arrested, overthrown, or put out of business very, very quickly. The exact nature of organized crime changes depending on a lot of things. You know, different organizations have different ways of doing things. Yakuza are different than the Mafia, and the Mafia are different than Latin American drug cartels, thing, etc. But, in every case, it is a disgusting and predatory business. The only people who would or could do it are ruthless and violent. And I feel weird saying this, but 365 days did it better? Because at least then, they had a love interest who was actually a mafia boss. <laughs> because unless you actually draw attention to Cal's murders and his other crimes, you, he's really just playing dress-up. He, he's playing dress-up. He's cosplaying as a mafia boss. And 
the more I think about it, the more I realize like that's the genius of The Sopranos, you know? It shows exactly how awful these sorts of people are, but it, it does make us sympathize with them a little bit, but it shows how awful they are, and it also shows how sad and pathetic they are. You know, they fight and kill each other over scraps, they're always demanding respect, but they never show it to others, not even their friends or family. They beat and abuse their wives and girlfriends. They constantly cheat on their wives and girlfriends. And even if they wind up succeeding as criminals and they make it big and they make a lot of money from it, they wind up dead or in prison sooner or later. And if you're thinking, well, if we told a story like that, it would be a poor romance novel. Exactly. Mafia romance is a genre that's dead on arrival. Trying to romanticize that sort of lifestyle and these sorts of organizations isn't just annoying, it's gross. And I'd be less concerned if it were adult women that were into this, because they're generally better at distinguishing fantasy from reality. But be honest, it's mostly teenagers that are into this kind of crap. You know, look, if you're going to write a romance novel, write a romance novel. You know, don't write a romance novel and then give it the plot of a thriller and then cast the thriller plot aside when it becomes inconvenient. Or maybe you should do that, I don't know. I, I can't stop you, and it certainly pays well. But I keep seeing people say that I dismiss romance as a genre out of hand, and I don't. Now, I don't respect the romance genre very much, but that's because it never tries. Like, the, the people who dominate it, who write the books that sell a whole lot, they never try at all. And the genre's proponents are embarrassed for even reading it. That's why they keep writing mafia romance and fantasy romance, but there's very little mafia in the mafia romance and there's very little fantasy in the fantasy romance. They just, they want to pretend it's something that it's not so that they don't have to feel ashamed for reading porn. Like, a lot of the stuff I read is weird and silly, but at least I'm honest about it. Now, is Brutal Prince the worst thing ever? Like, no, that, not, not at all, not at all. It's stupid, dull, and annoying, but it's really not that bad other than the moments where we're in Cal's head and we see just how psychotic he is. And there are a couple of things I liked. You know, at first I did like Ida, like she becomes terrible later, but I did like her at the beginning of the book. Uh, I liked Zayak as a villain. There are illustrations in here, which I'm not super into the art style, but it, it's kind of neat to have that. The sex scenes aren't my cup of tea, but if that's what you're looking for, they are competently written. And the book is short, you know, even with the bonus epilogue and the preview of the next book and all the illustrations, it's less than 300 pages, even with all that, so it went by pretty quick. And it's a completed story. There's no need to read the sequels if you don't want to. It's not offensive or particularly stupid, it's just boring and it's nonsensical. If the people who were into this sort of stuff just admitted that it was porn, then I would probably just ignore it and move on with my life and talk about other stuff that I was more interested in, but they refuse to admit that, and they keep a pretending that books like P Brutal Prince are totally real stories. It's not porn, it just has spice in it. And look, if you're going to pretend that these are regular books, then I'm going to treat them like regular books, and I'm going to critique them like they're regular books, and Brutal Prince just fails. Like, as a book, it fails in a lot of ways. It fails as a story, it fails with its characters. It's just not good. Goodbye. Hello there, friends. This is the outro part of the video where I thank all of my Patreon and YouTube channel members because without them, I don't know if I could keep doing this. Special thanks especially to my $10 and up patrons who are Arthur D. Gonzalez Martin, Brother Santodis, Carolina Clay, Dan Antselievich, Ich bin Longweilig, Jalal Delul, Lexi Delorme, Liza Rudakova, Lord Tiebreaker, Michael and Katie Hake, Pilar Garza, Rovi, Psych XS, Tesla Shark, Toa Michael, Vey Victus, and Wesley, as well as all the other names you see on the screen over here. If you want things like early access to my videos, as well as exclusive content that you can't just get here on YouTube, as well as uncensored content if I need to, and you can watch it all ad-free, then consider donating over there on Patreon, or becoming a YouTube channel member. Hell, you can even suggest me books to read nowadays, but there's a limited number of spots, so if you really want that, then go check it out. Anyways, that's about all I can say today, but you know what? Please like the video, comment on it, share it around to all of your communities. Just make your friends hate you. And uh, that's about it. Goodbye. I love you.